Today, I would like to explore Lafcadio O'Hearn's surprisingly deep interest in doctors and medical science. There are two reasons for Hearn's interest. First, his journalist's desire for interesting topics, and second, his personal physical health. How to stay energetic to maintain what he called nerve force or mental energy was never far from his thoughts. He had likely become cautious about his health after losing vision in his left eye and the precarious condition of his remaining good eye, his sole window on the world, was constantly in the back of his mind. Indeed, his fear of blindness alone would account for a deep interest in what medical professionals had to say. But he had other health concerns as well. For example, he had suffered greatly from dengue in New Orleans, from debilitating fevers in Martinique, from lung and digestive disorders in Matsue, from severe eye strain in Kobe, and from bronchial bleeding and heart attacks in Tokyo. So health and doctors were frequently on his mind. Hearn's knowledge of medical science increased greatly after becoming a journalist, but his awareness of it probably began as a small boy, vaguely cognizant that his father was a ship's doctor for the British Army. It probably deepened as a teenager when he was treated, ultimately unsuccessfully, by London ophthalmologists for his severely injured left eye. But it was his career as a journalist for newspapers in Cincinnati and New Orleans that afforded him multiple opportunities to investigate and write about articles on recent developments in science including a very large number on medical science, more than he wrote on any other scientific field. As a professional writer, he gathered his scientific information from various sources. Sometimes he visited a curious or newsworthy scientist or doctor for an interview. Sometimes he reported on an interesting breakthrough he had seen in a recent newspaper or magazine article. Sometimes he consulted his own expanding library of scientific volumes. And sometimes he simply asked his close physician friends, Dr. Rudolf Mattis in New Orleans and Dr. George Gould in Philadelphia. Whatever the source, Hearn's ultimate purpose was always the same, to write thought-provoking articles or stories, engagingly written, in one of his several writing styles, sometimes humorous, sometimes almost gruesome. He wrote on such medical subjects as open skull brain surgery, blood drinking, eye transplantation, and Creole folk medicine with its very unorthodox but effective pharmacopoeia. Uh, you can see in the slide a list of some of the uh, diseases and folk remedies that Hearn published. In fact, Hearn succeeded so well in popularizing scientific news that in 1883, he was made the main science writer for the New Orleans Times Democrat newspaper. In addition to his published writings, Hearn's private letters also shed light on his thoughts about medical science. Many letters mention bouts of either his own, a family member's, or a friend's illness. He also dispensed medical advice in letters to ailing acquaintances. His letters also reveal that he carefully chose the exercise he took, preferring sweatless activities such as swimming and Japanese archery or kudo. He was also particular about the food he ate, considering a protein-rich Western diet 
to be the key to maintaining the vitality he needed to be able to write. The letter is penned in Japan, in which he counsels his former student about a possible career in medicine, provide particularly detailed insight into his thinking. Both in his personal life and in his sketches, doctors played significant roles as friends, healthcare consultants, informants, and subjects for his writing. His attitude toward doctors, however, was not always reverential. When it suited him, he parodied their language or questioned the credibility of their diagnostic skills. First, let's look at the doctors Hearn knew personally and developed intellectual relations with. What did he think of them and how did they influence him? Then, I will introduce Hearn's ideas about the profession of medical doctor as expressed in his letters. Perhaps the most important doctor in Hearn's life was Rudolf Mattis, who specialized in internal medicine and anesthesiology. You can see a photo of Dr. Mattis when Hearn knew him and later when he became famous. Although Hearn had already done some medical reporting in Cincinnati, it was the young Spanish-American doctor, Rodolfo Mattis, more than any other physician who deepened and broadened Hearn's knowledge of medical science. According to the biographer of Hearn's American period, E.L. Tinker, the young Dr. Mattis, a graduate of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, now Tulane University School of Medicine, was so impressed with Hearn's writing that he arranged to meet him. Hearn quickly became impressed with Mattis's encyclopedic medical knowledge and a close friendship developed. They shared a love of books, stimulated each other's thoughts, and each believed in the other's future greatness. In addition to providing Hearn with medical knowledge for his writing, Mattis also generously furnished him with sound research-based personal medical advice both for Hearn and occasionally for Hearn's friends. Hearn's faith in the depth and breadth of Mattis's medical knowledge can be seen in this letter to a friend. Quote, Mattis, demonstrator at the medical university, although very young, is the most scholarly physician in regard to medical literature I ever met. He is also a polyglot and familiar with the medicine of all Europe nearly. To give you an instance of his reading, I went to him one day with a question about the character of the old Arabian medicine, and he instantly repeated for me the dreadful names of all the old Hispano-Moorish and Arabian surgeons and chemists and physicians with the names of their great works. I think he will be one of the greatest physicians in the United States. Indeed, Hearn was so impressed, he unreservedly offered Mattis's medical advice to his editor, Paige Baker. Baker was suffering from a stubborn intestinal ailment that he was trying to cure rather unsuccessfully by modifying his diet according to the recommendation of a Dr. Belden. Hearn consulted Mattis for a second opinion. Quote, I have been talking with Mattis. He seems to think a good deal of Belden and said the diet was just what it ought to be. He also explained to me the difficulties of the case and told me that Marion Sims, one of the great names in American medicine, could only get cured of a similar chronic trouble by a prolonged sojourn at Cooper's Wells, the waters of which he drank continually and so cured himself. I asked him if Sims might not have just wanted to advertise Cooper's Wells. He said, no, 
that it was a well-authenticated case of cure by simple means. So I hope, if this be true, that you will go as soon as you are well to some place where similar waters flow and so get strong forever. Whether or not Mr. Baker followed Hearn's advice is not known, but judging from Hearn's letter, Dr. Mattis was certainly an open-minded physician willing to entertain unconventional treatments so long as they were based on well-authenticated studies. The breadth of Mattis's medical interests can also be seen in Hearn's letter to Henry Krebiel, his music critic friend. They had both been wondering whether or not an anatomical variation could explain the difference they felt in the timber of the voices of blacks and whites. Of course, Hearn asked Mattis's opinion. This was not a normal medical issue and belonged to the relatively new field of comparative anatomy. Yet, Mattis was not only intrigued, he had already done some reading in the medical journals of this emerging field. Hearn happily told Mattis's opinion to Krebiel. Quote, he states that only microscopic work can reveal the full details of differentiation in the vocal organs of races, but calls my attention to several differences already noticed. Gibb has proved, for instance, that the cartilages of Risberg are larger in the Negro. This would not affect the voice especially, but the fact promises revelations of a more important kind. Again, we see that Mattis based his opinions on proven studies such as Gibbs, not on speculation, even citing the specific research publication involved. Such wide reading of the medical literature surely impressed Hearn and inspired confidence in Mattis. Now, what did Mattis say of Hearn? Well, he said that he provided Hearn with a great deal of medical knowledge for use in his writing, especially for his novel, Cheetah. Hearn felt so indebted to Mattis that he not only dedicated the book to him, he privately considered Mattis to be the book's co-author. Mattis later wrote that he was especially proud of this role in the composition of Cheetah, specifically, quote, the physiognomy of death in the terminal stages of yellow fever, unquote. Indeed, Hearn obtained a wealth of medical information from Dr. Mattis. The other important doctor in Hearn's life was Dr. George Milbury Gould, the ophthalmologist. The friendship between Hearn and Dr. Gould, a graduate of Philadelphia's Jefferson Medical College, began the same way as the friendship between Hearn and Dr. Mattis. Namely, in both cases, it was the doctor who sought out Hearn and not vice versa. Both physicians had been enormously impressed with Hearn's writings, were curious to know the man behind the words. Gould had read Hearn's articles and wrote him letters of admiration. Hearn grew pleased with the burgeoning epistolary friendship and wrote Gould, quote, it is a singular fact that most of my tried friends have been physicians. When Hearn was ready to leave Martinique, Gould offered him a room in his Philadelphia townhouse where Hearn could work on his book. Hearn gratefully accepted and for five months in 1889, 
he delighted in Gould's friendship, hospitality, and seemingly vast knowledge. As Hearn wrote in a letter to his former landlady in New Orleans, Mrs. Courtney, quote, I am in the house of a very good friend. I have luck with doctors like you have. A physician here, an oculist. If anything happened to my eyes, I would be in good hands. Like Mattis, Gould also helped Hearn with his personal health issues, particularly his eyesight. In their free time, they discussed literature, philosophy, science, and each other's writings. Hearn listened to and rejected Gould's idea for a medical novel, and he helped Gould compile a medical dictionary. Unlike Mattis, however, Gould seemed to wish to change Hearn. He tried to reform him, morally and philosophically, an endeavor that Hearn did not resist, both men claiming that the doctor had given Hearn something he was sorely lacking, namely, a soul. The story of their falling out the financial disagreements and the publication after Hearn's death of Gould's acrimonious memoir concerning Lafcadio Hearn are well known. But for five months at Gould's house, Hearn was as happy and comfortable and productive as he had ever been before. Like Mattis, Gould had also stimulated Hearn's thinking and satisfied Hearn's natural curiosity about science in general and medical science in particular. In Japan, Hearn was mainly treated by two physicians, but neither seems to have had any influence on his thinking. In Kobe, Hearn befriended his eye doctor Dr. Edward Papelier, a German ophthalmologist who advised him to quit newspaper work to save his remaining eyesight. But Papelier's intellectual or literary influence on Hearn was probably negligible. Mostly, according to uh, biographer Nina Kennard, he just listened to Hearn talk. In Tokyo, Hearn's family doctor was Dr. Kizawa, but again, there is no indication that the relationship was anything more than one of doctor-patient. In May 1903, when Hearn suffered from bronchial bleeding, Dr. Kizawa advised him to stop his daily walks and his annual swimming at Yaizu and to refrain from lecturing. It was also Dr. Kizawa who attended Hearn in September 1904 when he had three heart attacks, angina pectoris, the last one fatal. My next topic considers Hearn's ideas about the physician as a profession. Hearn genuinely admired most doctors and at the rather advanced age of 34, declared to friend Krabiel that he was seriously thinking of becoming one. Quote, I have half a mind to study medicine in practical earnest someday. Wouldn't I make an imposing doctor in the country of cowboys? A doctor might also do well in Japan. I'm thinking seriously about it. Well, despite his rather advanced age and totally inadequate financial resources for such an undertaking, that's four years of graduate medical school, Hearn seems to have believed he could do it. Well, this was not quite pure fantasy. After all, Hearn's father was a doctor, 
a graduate of the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, and an assistant surgeon in the British Army, serving on his ships. <clears throat> Although Hearn hardly knew his father and was separated from him while too young to understand much about his occupation, he had inherited his father's genes, like it or not, and perhaps with them a natural interest in, if not an aptitude for, medicine. If his father could do it, maybe so could he. But why specify the American West or Japan as places to practice? To Hearn, possessing a doctor's skill meant more than obtaining financial security or social respectability. There was something even more precious, freedom to travel and sojourn in relatively remote, undiscovered, interesting areas of the world. He was aware that in the more densely populated areas, even doctors faced stiff competition. But as a physician in places where doctors were scarce, he would be an important, even an imposing figure. To Hearn, doctors had something he sorely envied, namely the skills to earn a living anywhere they chose. Consider this letter to Paige Baker, written just prior to Hearn's trip to the French West Indies. Quote, Saturday next I flee. There are only two other passengers. Nobody goes to such an outrageous part of the world at this most outrageous time, except physicians and fellows like me. These other passengers are physicians. They leave at Barbados. Only physicians and fellows like me, by which Hearn meant poor writers in search of material, literary Columbuses, had the chance to visit and live in such interesting places as Barbados. The difference, of course, was that doctors could make a decent living in those places and stay as long as they liked whereas writers like Hearn had to live hand to mouth. In Japan, Hearn recommended his former pupil, Ochiai Teisaburo, to study medicine rather than language and literature. Quote, I imagine that you may have special qualities fitting you to become a good doctor, qualities of character, kindness, and truthfulness in thinking and doing." Unquote. Perhaps remembering the doctors who were going to Barbados, he also told Ochiai that being a doctor would enable him to travel. The profession would help you to travel later on. I think that all larger steamships, for example, employ good doctors who have plenty of leisure for studies while voyaging. Hearn is also probably remembering his father, a ship's doctor, paid to travel the world. Six months later, Hearn wrote another letter to OGI explaining in further detail why he recommended medical studies. Firstly, it will assure your independence and make you large-minded and makes a better man of anyone who is intelligent enough to master its principles. As Hearn also knew well from his medically related articles, quote, there are many very horrible things in it which you will have to face, but you must not be repelled by these because the facts behind them are very beautiful and wonderful." Unquote. Perhaps most importantly, medical study was in itself fascinating. Hearn wrote, it will show you that the most ordinary human body is full of machinery more wonderful than any genius ever invented. 
Yet another important advantage that Hearn believed the life of a doctor could provide for OGI was the chance to use his linguistic ability and to enjoy literature. Quote, also do not forget that your knowledge of English will be of great use to you in medicine, and that if you love literature, medicine will give you plenty of chance to indulge that love. In Kobe, I find that some of the best Japanese doctors find English very useful to them, not only in their practice, but also in their private studies. Hearn was assuring Ochi that the life of a doctor would give him the means and leisure to continuously enrich himself with knowledge and experiences gleaned from studying science, reading literature, and visiting new places. Helping others does not seem to have been on Hearn's mind. There was, however, one problem that worried Hearn. And this was Ochi's health. To practice medicine in any large city in Japan, Hearn wrote, you must have a vigorous body, you must not be too weak. It is a profession requiring strength, or at least nervous strength, the power to bear much fatigue. In the end, despite Hearn's advice, Ochi chose to study English literature, not medicine. A few years later, however, Hearn would again be contemplating whether or not to advise another young man to become a doctor, his own son, Kazuo. Although Hearn generally respected medical doctors, he sometimes privately made fun of the style of their esoteric research papers and doubted their opinions. Here's one example. From New York, he sent Dr. Gould the gist of an article that made fun of physicians' diagnostic skills. Quote, last Sunday, the New York World had an editorial denying the scientific exactness of medicine. It sent a girl reporter, a fine, healthy, handsome person, to 20 different physicians and each declared she had a different disease and all prescribed for her. And then the world publishes all the prescriptions in facsimile and the names of the doctors and made geese of them like hell. 20 doctors examine the same patient and no two diagnoses were the same Hearn was greatly amused. Doctors who took themselves too seriously, he felt, were legitimate targets of satire. In conclusion, as I've tried to show, Hearn's relationship to medicine was long and deep, personal and literary. Medical science had nearly always been closely connected to his life. As a child of a doctor, he may have inherited his father's aptitude for medical science. When he injured his eye at age 16, he was painfully introduced to the world of ophthalmology. And as a newspaper reporter, he counted physicians among his closest friends and used their knowledge and his own researches to write about medical subjects. In Japan, he <clears throat> excuse me, in Japan, he advised his students to study medicine if they had the aptitude and the health. And he praised the profession as one of the noblest. To Mattis, he once wrote, <clears throat> Quote, you know Philadelphia, I suppose, the beautiful city, <clears throat> and I suppose you know that physicians here form the leaders of and give the tone to social life. It seems to me but just that they should, 
representing the highest intellectual rank of civilization when they are really worthy of the profession. Although he always considered himself to be first and foremost a writer, the world of doctors and medical science was never far from his mind, and it often appears in his writing in a variety of engaging contexts. Thank you.